Welcome to this uh, episode of Inks's uh, Horizon series. Uh, we're joined today by Sir Jeremy Farrar, who has been a strong supporter of Inksa from the outset, and is, of course, the director of the Wellcome Trust, and before that, professor of tropical medicine at Oxford, and spent many years in Vietnam, where he, of course, was involved with the bird flu pandemic in, I think, 2004, and has much knowledge of many pandemics. He's a member of the Science Advisory Group for Emergencies, which has been called in Britain uh, in relationship to, to uh, COVID. And of course, the Wellcome Trust itself has taken an enormously important leadership role in, in relationship to progressing science in relationship to this and other infectious disease pandemics. So Jeremy, in terms of we're a year into the pandemic, do you think governments have learnt lessons about how to use science well in emergencies, or do you think there's a long way to go and that it'll take a while before they really understand how to incorporate evidence better into decision making? Well, Peter, it's, it's great to uh, join you, albeit virtually, and, um, and uh, thank you for your leadership over many years now of the um, of the group that brings together science advice in government around the world. Um, you've got to be an optimist because if, if you're not, it, uh, the world is too dark and, and uh, um, you've got to hope that out of a crisis like this, which is, you know, you'd hope you don't face crises like this all the time, but there will be more, um, that governments around the world will take a very hard look at themselves and say, what do we get right and what do we get wrong? I, uh, that's the optimistic side of me, that lessons will be learned. The pessimistic side of me says, in a world now, I'm afraid, with a number of governments, um, with populist policies and uh, almost running permanent campaigns, that governments won't have the courage to actually say what went right and what went wrong. But I think that's the role of organizations that are like yours um, and like maybe ours to some degree to try and hold politicians and the system to account for uh, the good things that have happened in many parts of the world, but also the lessons to be learned. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I'm wondering whether, I mean, given that organ many epidemiologists and people like yourself heralded that the pan a pandemic such as this was inevitable and it existed in many countries' risk registers or, or equivalents, uh, how do we get governments to take risk assessment more seriously in relationship to these acute episodes? I mean, it seems to me that it was that I think even in Britain there were the it was not really accepted that the inevitability of a pandemic of this magnitude could happen. Yeah, I think it is very difficult for all of us to um, contemplate and to put in place systems for for these um, not low probability because, as you rightly say, the, these events are inevitable, and um, maybe we come back to the modern world and why they're likely to be more frequent and more complex than in the past. Uh, but it is difficult when governments around the world, bear in mind, have come out of ten years of austerity in many parts of the world after the great financial crisis. I, I, I think the response to this. Uh, has been coloured by the austerity that came out of that uh, great financial crisis for a decade after 2008-2009 or so. Um, uh, and, and the uh, unwillingness uh, or, the, or the complexity of putting in place systems and investments that you may not need, you may not use, or you don't know when you're going to use, it probably won't be in your time as a prime minister or president, it'll be in somebody else's time. Those are difficult for populist politicians around the world uh, to prepare for, when it'll happen at some point potentially in the future after they've left office. And I think that long-term planning within government, long-term investment in things that you're not sure when you're gonna need is something that, that has to come out of this as one of the lessons. I would agree with that. I also think that, you know, politicians 
want things they can get credit for and preventing something doesn't create credit. So, and also, you know, it's always something can be put off for next year. I mean, it's one of the yep. problems that we have in research as a whole, that governments can say, well, yes, we need more R&D, but we can always defer our investment to another year. I mean, and so I think that risk assessment has got to be high on the agenda of countries now. I mean, I don't think they took it very seriously really after the Sendai process in 2015. Will they take it more seriously now? But uh, you also, you, you, you're, you're also right that uh, a, a pandemic, you know, actually in reality, most likely historically to have been influenza, I think is on every country's risk register. Yeah. Uh, certainly on the UK's risk, risk register. In fact, it has been over the last few years one of the highest issues on that risk register. Um, but, you know, risk registers have become something of a tick box exercise. Yes. It's on a, it's on a risk register, so therefore it's OK. Um, you see this in organisations, you see it in, uh, in, uh, in gov national governments, and you see it in multilateral organisations as well. There's a sense that because we've passed an audit, We've passed, uh, we've ticked a box that a pandemic is on a risk register, therefore somebody's got sight of it. And the reality is, of course, they didn't. Exactly. And I think one of the issues, and, I, and funny enough, we've just released a report last week uh, pointing out that unless a risk register leads to an accountability for action on managing and mitigating that risk, it's not much use. Yeah, uh, agree with that. There has to be an action linked to it. Uh, the, but the problem also goes back, and, and these are excuses in a way, Peter. I mean, the, we're trying to be charitable here to, to say, you know, what, what positives could come out of this. Um, the reality is, is that when your action is a preventative one, as you said, then I'm afraid, and particularly over the last 20 years, well, let's face it, we've had warning after warning after warning. We had SARS-1, which I was very involved in when living in Vietnam. Uh, bird flu, of course, which came to nothing. We've had Ebola in West Africa, which, of course, Ebola would never be a global pandemic, but massively disruptive to particularly three countries in, in West Africa. We've had MERS in the Middle East. We've had Zika in Central and South America. We've had, of course, the, the spread of, of dengue. And we've had the slow burn of pandemic of drug-resistant infection. We've had a warning in reality, every two or three years for the last 20 years. So, I mean, it's, do you think in terms of this, that we need to get acting into the science of how political decision-making is made? Well, we've spent a lot of time thinking about the, sci the science of pandemics or the science of climate change or the science of earthquakes. Do we actually understand enough, taking, actually about how decisions are made and how we actually get uh, people who are in the position to make decisions to understand the evidence appropriately. Do we actually know enough? Is this an area which needs more actual research? Or is it a matter of just iterative improvement after every crisis? Yeah, I, of, of course it does need more research. I, th I think it, it needs more research into the way science is formed and the way scientists and policymakers in politics and in the civil service inter interact. But like a lot of good research, um, it will improve things, it will evolve over time, it'll get better. But we know enough already. Yeah. Um, I, we know enough already that um, evidence-based policy decision tends to or always leads to better outcomes. Uh, we know that science, and we've shown this through the last 12 months, in fact, the, the reality was that in many, many countries, actually the scientific evidence, um, of course, got stronger over 2020 and into 2021. But nevertheless, the scientific evidence was clear at the end of January 2020, that here you had an animal virus coming across to humans, which humanity had no immunity for, it was spread by the respiratory route, it had a natural R of, of, of above three, uh, you could be asymptomatic all the way through tragically to dying. You had enough that an undergraduate program would teach you this is going to be bad. Exactly. But so the evidence was there. And if you put those things together, the asymptomatic transmission, the R above three, the no immunity, 
in a big city, uh, uh, an animal virus with no immunity. If you put those things together, then from that moment onwards, about the 20th or 24th of January 2020, a global pandemic was then, an, was then a certainty um, because that makes that infection extraordinarily difficult to control. So the epidemic spreading into being at least a regional epidemic, if not actually a global pandemic, from that moment onwards, I think was inevitable. The response to it, as New Zealand has shown, uh, has not been good enough around the world. The, the New Zealand, Australia as well, other countries, China itself, Singapore, Vietnam, Norway, have shown that good policy making on the basis of strong evidence and good science can lead to a much better outcome of a horrible crisis. And I think if you speak from the New Zealand point of view, I think there were two aspects to that. One was quick decision making. It was a simple decision making process, not a complex decision making process. It was scientifically supported and it was publicly transparent. And I think it's those things of public transparency that brought high levels of trust in the public cooperating with what have, you know, yes, we've had great outcomes, but it's not been easy on the population in doing so. Very, very difficult. And, you know, unless you've lived through it as New Zealanders have, it's very difficult for people on the outside to understand what New Zealand has gone through, what China indeed went through in trying to lock down, in, in actually achieving lockdowns and restricting the pandemic in China as well. It's been, it has been tough. But the things you, you talk about there are, I believe, absolutely critical to navigating through a crisis like this. The speed of action is absolutely fundamental. If you get behind the epidemic curve, you're stuffed. Exactly. Um, you'll never catch up. And you've got to be willing to make decisions in uncertainty. And the worst thing you can do, the regret is to not make the decision. And, and remember, and I think this has been a problem in many, many countries, not making a decision is a decision in itself. Right. Putting and off a decision till tomorrow is a decision and you have to be held accountable for, th for that decision as well, even if it is a non-decision. The evidence base through science, uh, yes, it's evolved, yes, it's changed, but it was strong enough at the end of January and beginning of February of, of last year. And then critically, your comment there about the transparency of communication, the, the willingness, the humility to say that we don't know everything at the moment, but we believe this is the best thing to do and we will keep you totally informed of what's happening. That transparency, I think, is again, if you, the hallmark of, of uh, the countries that have handled this well, I think has been the transparency of communication between decision makers and the public. You see, I think that links to a broader question that you, that, you know, managing a pandemic re need requires social cooperation. It requires people to make a lot of behavioural choices on their own account, in effect. And that's very hard to achieve unless you have good social cohesion, either imposed by one form of government or, because of, or, or another. You know? And I think that what we've seen, it's been the more cohesive countries of the East to have greater trust or, or, or dependency on their government have been able to achieve, as you said, and Vietnam and, and Singapore and Korea, Taiwan, New Zealand, Australia, all with different government systems, but inherently a more uh, coherent view between the citizen and the state than has been apparent in a number of the Western democracies. Yeah, that social contract has been critical. And, and again, uh, we talk about speed of action, speed of decision making in a crisis, which is it is crucial. But the, um, the, your, the state of the country, the state of the society going into a crisis also has a massive impact on your ability to cope with that crisis. And um, if we certainly look at uh, uh, the levels of trust uh, or dependency, you know, and, and, and you may well be right in that, it's not just all about um, openness and trust, but the, but the sense of trust in authority and the social contract, and it has to be said, a le um, less inequality within the societies in which you're operating in. If you look at um, the standout country in, in the European context for me is Norway. Absolutely stand out in uh, Norway, Finland, Denmark, and not Sweden. And there's interesting reasons why that should be true. 
But one of the strong, if you look at Norway, look at Singapore, look at New Zealand, uh, look at Vietnam, uh, these had very strong social contracts leading up to the crisis. Um, and I think that stood in great stead when if push comes to shove, if you're not quite sure what to do, but the default is, well, actually, you know, mostly we trust the government and we have a social contract and there is a degree we, we do believe that they will look after us in a crisis. I do think that carries great weight when it comes to dealing with a crisis. It's interesting. In New Zealand, over the period of the last six months of last year, the trust surveys actually show an increasing rise in trust in government over the period of the pandemic, which is quite fascinating compared to what yes. I suspect has happened in many of countries where it's gone not very well. And now we're in a new stage of the pandemic where clearly the issues of vaccines, trust in, in vaccination programs is being confronted with, with science being pulled into ideology. So we're now seeing the conflation, or well, we saw it also in the social distancing issues, where political ideology is being conflated with science. This is, to my mind, it's been there before, I guess, in areas like creationism versus yep. evolution. But I think it's more acute now than ever, this, this linkage between political ideology and behaviour, at least in some countries, and also then fueled by various forms of disinformation. Uh, how do you actually think science is going to survive? How do we actually protect science in this environment where it's being politicised or the attitude to science is being politicised? Yeah, so on this one, I am more optimistic um, because I think over the last, you're right, over the last, well, decades, there's been, humanity has, if you like, flirted with with some of the things you talk about, I think, um, uh, creationism, uh, challenging uh, scientific um, norms, um, politicization, ideology into science. But let's look at the last 12 months and what has really delivered over the last 12 months, whether you talk about it in the context of vaccines or you talk about it in the context of therapeutics or diagnostic tests or understanding the evolution of the virus or just on the front page of every newspaper in every country there is now a general conversation about confidence intervals about levels of r about what transmission means about what a virus is compared to what a bacteria is the knowledge of science language has gone to levels that certainly i've not seen in my professional life and the discourse from the newspapers to standing in a queue at a shop or in general conversation with family who are not scientists, the level of knowledge of some of these scientific words and their real meaning has gone to new levels that we've never seen before. And, and many scientists around the world have become, not icons, but they've become great communicators. And I think it behoves the scientific community to appreciate that an amazing science contribution doesn't have to be in a laboratory or in a hospital or anywhere else. It can be in policy making, it can be in politics, it can be in journalism, it can be in the, on the TV. Science careers can be any one or all of those. And I think uh, scientists in the future have got to see that our science is part of our culture, our culture is part of our politics, and therefore we have to engage in all of that if we want the scientific evidence to have a role in society. Which it must, because at the end Which of the it day, must. it's the only way we have to have any reliable information about the world within and around us. And that it must. hard choices ahead around climate change and many other issues ahead of us. And just switching themes a little bit, the Wellcome Trust is one of the few organisations that acts truly globally. How do you feel the global communities work together? It certainly worked together very well in developing the vaccines and some of that. But how do you feel the science communities actually work to get well internationally? And how do you think the science policy and policy communities worked globally in the face of this pandemic? Yeah, there's a lot of lot behind that, Peter. And I think there's there's here it's a mixed card. I, I think the um on the science itself, and, and when I talk about science, I, I, of course I mean the vaccines, but I do also mean 
understanding the social sciences. I mean, understanding and 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 working together on behavioral science, um, on anthropology and inequality and social determinants. I, I I mean the broad range of science. There, I think scientists at a global level have shared in ways that we haven't seen before. Um, their, their data, their information has been put in the public domain as almost as soon as it's uh, as it's done. Uh, sometimes to the detriment. Uh, uh, not a, not all of the scientific community can look back with pride on the last year. The uh, some scientists, I think, forgot science when they were coming out and talking about how chloroquine was going to be the answer to everything. And I think they confused science and propaganda. Uh, science and public relations, and frankly, science and their own egos. Uh, and science exists because you have a hypothesis and you go out and prove it, and you um, provide the evidence in which you've done that. But overall, I think the scientific community and science itself has has really delivered. On the multilateral side, though, got to remember, multilateralism exists because nation states want it to exist. And we shouldn't forget, even in an era of, of uh, regional blocks and things, the nation state remains where the power is. And frankly, the multilateral organizations are, in their own words, either secretariats, which is, a, I think, a horrible phrase. Um, uh, they're either secretariats. They're there at the uh, pleasure, if you like, of nation states. And frankly, during this crisis, nationalism and nation states have re-exerted their, their power base. I think to the detriment of the ability of the world to deal with the crisis. Uh, you've seen American Chinese tensions. You've seen tensions in the European Union. You've seen, the only area we haven't really seen tensions, it seems to me, is between Australia and New Zealand, but maybe that's just, you know, we haven't seen it yet. Um, we had a rugby game recently, that's all. <laughs> um, but I think we, multilateralism only works and the multilateral fin, uh, institutions, whether they be financial, World Bank, IMF, or technical, the WHO and its agencies, they can only exist when they have the support of the member states. And if the member states are taking a very nationalistic approach to things, then those agencies struggle to work. They don't, uh, you know, they don't have an army, they don't have a power base. Uh, they can nudge, they can push, they can encourage, they can provide advice. But in the end, if nation states don't want to, don't want them to work, they won't work. So do you think there's a greater role then for track two organisations other than the nation, the multilateral nation state system? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I, I think the, um, I I personally think that one of the lessons coming out of this is if we are, and this is why vaccine nationalism and inequality at the moment, I think is so frightening. Because if we're going to really, what are the great challenges of the 21st century? What are they? They are, you know, we could argue what they are, but I think everybody would agree. Their climate, their demographic shifts, their inequality, uh, their haves and have nots uh, from economic uh, uh, inequality. Uh, their pandemics, of course, uh, their energy access, their water access, and there's others that we could all argue about. But none of them are national, effectively. They will have their impacts nationally, but they're all trans-border. And one of the great concerns I've got as we now go in an era where some countries will have access to the exit strategy, vaccines and other things, all the tools we need, um, that it'll be much harder to, to forge a multilateral consensus in the future of how we deal with climate change or future pandemics because the nation states are, are reasserting their power base. And that leads to a bit of a mantra that I've been talking about a lot with Vaughan Tarikian over the future of science diplomacy, where I think a lot of the science diplomacy has to be at the level of persuading your own government, that it's in their self-interest to, to promote work on the global commons. In other words, it's in their vested self-interest to work collectively. And that's, I think, where the battle has to take place, is at the level of domestic governments to explain yeah, to Peter, them. I, I think I absolutely agree with you. Um, 
and therefore science has to get um, and scientists have to become streetwise as to why why political decisions and how political decisions are made. That means being part of the political process. If, if there is no point the scientific community complaining about the political process, but not engaging with it Correct. and not understanding it. Um, and that means not just understanding your own area of biomedical science or social sciences and remaining in your silo and making the arguments for your ology. What it means is understanding that politicians have to combine all of that, plus many other aspects, financial, economic, social and everything else. And it's in that context that decision making happens. And I think we scientists uh, have to engage in that process. There are, uh, we can't complain there are too many arts graduates in politics if science graduates don't step into politics. No, and I think there are systems where, and I think the UK has traditionally been seen to be a place where science has had good access to the political process with various forms of science advisory mechanisms from the official ones to, to the role of the Royal Society and so forth. Why didn't it work this time as well as it might have? Yeah, that's a, that is, I think for the UK at least, that is the key question. Um, uh, so I, I would frame the last 15 months into sort of, if you like, two sections. They're, they're not equal in time. Um, I would argue now in, in uh, 12 months into 15 months in that actually the science advice now is in a very good place in terms of, of policy decision making. Um, the problem in the UK is that that arrived, if you like, too late. Um, if that if that if that scientific input had been given the uh, the the um, platform. Um, earlier on, uh, and to be honest, if it had communicated perhaps itself a little bit clearer, a little bit blunter, um, and been perhaps a little bit more streetwise about that advice, uh, then I think it would have got, because pandemics are defined by what you do early on, not why, by what you do late. So it's great to say now, I think the scientific advice into the UK government is actually extremely good. And the government, certainly since the beginning of January this year, have absolutely followed that advice. But we've got to learn how that, that kicks in on day one, hour one of the crisis, rather than hour one year. Was it too complex? Were there too many players at the beginning? Yeah, I, I think there were, um, I think there was a paucity of understanding of science within the government machinery outside the scientists themselves. And that led to you know, in a crisis, in a, it's frightening, it's chaotic. Um, there's a degree of uncertainty. I think it, the government found it very difficult to sift through a lot of different voices in order to be able to understand the reality. And frankly, there were a lot of different voices at that stage arguing for different things from the Great Barrington Declaration that actually we somehow all had immunity um, and that actually this was just going to go away. In fact, already had gone away. Uh, I think that led to confusion in government and a sense, well, science don't know what they're talking about. There, there's so many different views here. We can't listen to any of them. And that was a tragic error. Uh, the, also, I mean, it may be that the, the finer points of how SAGE plays into the COBRA or the, uh, the government decision-making process is, is significantly different, say, from New Zealand. And I just wonder when, when we go back and look at it in the future, we'll realize that some of those subtle differences, who sat at which table may really matter in terms of how quick decisions get made. Yeah, I, I think you can look for the bigger picture and the overall structure, but in the end, I think often it comes down to what you just said, which is which table are you at and who's there? Exactly. Um, and I think that the other, again, if I, if I look at lessons that from a distance and I don't know all the details, so, so don't, so bear with me, but, if I do look at, at Norway, if I do look at Vietnam, if I do look at New Zealand and Australia, I think very early on, there was a, a great clarity around that decision making process. And it was inclusive and it was open and it was transparent. But nevertheless, it wasn't a cacophony of noise. Uh, it was very clear where accountability lay and where the decision making processes exactly. came in. Exactly. And uh, for instance, Australia, which um, you know, has a federal structure, uh, 
which could complicate things. It's complicating things now in America, of course, with a federal and a, and a, and a state system. It's complicating uh, the pandemic phase now in Germany with the Lander and the federal government. And in the UK, of course, it's, it's, it's four countries. Um, but the problem in the UK, I think, was that there was, there was, there was not a cohesive enough central four nation authority that sat on top of everything and did things together essentially like a crisis cabinet whereas i believe in australia that did come very early on and uh, and of course in the new zealand system it's slightly different it's very simple uh the i mean we should probably wrap up soon but i'm really interested in your views you know we have we're now 15 months in there are countries there that have got reasonably high acceptance of vaccination. There are other countries, including countries like France and Japan, where there seems to be a high resistance, a relatively high resistance to vaccination. How do you feel this is going to play out, say, over the next two to three years? So I'm actually more sanguine and, and optimistic than others. The, big, the biggest risk, I think, is is uh, inequality in transmission, inequality of access to the vaccine and haves and haves not. So that the transmission and a lot of virus in big populations continues to circulate and new variants come up, which escape natural immunity and vaccination. I think my view is there's a, there's a I'm trying to quantify this and it, obviously this is plucked from the sky. I think the risk of that is, is about 10% or so actually in terms of variants. Science must deal with that. Science must prepare the second and third generation vaccines and new treatments and new diagnostic tests. But society also needs to be aware that could happen. And the way of preventing that is to drive down transmission, particularly in, well, in all countries, but particularly in countries with very big populations where transmission is out of control. So South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Brazil, maybe in the future, Nigeria, Ethiopia, the big population countries where where evolution will drive new variants. So the greatest risk is we go into a world where some countries, the rich world, are vaccinated and middle and low income countries are not vaccinated and transmission just continues and we get the new variants. That's the biggest risk. Uh, that's what we must work in now through 2021 to avoid um, because then we would go back to something like uh, March of, of, of 2020. I am more optimistic on this. I think we're going through the worst phase at the moment of vaccine uh, nationalism uh, because supply is massively out, demand is massively outstripping supply. Uh, and New Zealand's recent uh, uh, donation of I think 800,000 doses of vaccine to the COVAX facility is again showing real leadership. And that is something that the rest of the world needs to follow um, because it's, as you said earlier, in their enlightened self-interest. Uh, and why this is so important is because if we don't get this right, if we have a world where some countries are vaccinated and others are not, we will have a very fragmented, unequal world. We'll have countries that can't trade and travel with other countries. That will lead to populist politicians. That will lead to economic hardship. That will lead in the end somehow to conflict, I think. That is what is at stake here. Uh, and we will not be able to bring the world together to deal with climate change or the other challenges of the 21st century. So how we deal with the next six months, I think, is going to define in many ways the coming decades. On that note, uh, a very profound note, Jeremy, thank you very, very much. Great pleasure, Peter. Thank you very much.